Hey everybody, I'm Clara Vidala, so I'm kind of going to introduce our panel a little bit and then um, I'll introduce Sarah, our first reader, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, so I met Sarah actually on Twitter, I think, yeah. is the first time I <laughs> talked to you. Um, and I realized she was a PhD student here. I did my undergraduate work here before I went to vet school at A&M, so I'm very familiar with this area and the creative writing side of things. I did a lot of that while I was here too. So it was really fun to get involved with somebody who's in that program now doing the graduate work. Um, and then she knew Megan, um, so we kind of had this hodgepodge pull together a panel <laughs> um, but I'm really excited to hear some poems. These are two fantastic poets, and I'm happy to be reading with them today. Our theme is kind of exploring what it means to be wild and how that uh, relates to how we interpret the world around us. So I think all of us probably have a little bit of a different perspective, but that's kind of the aim that we started from when we started the panel, um, and that's kind of where our poems are going to be centered today. So uh, Sarah's going to start us off, and I have to look up her bio on my phone here, but I've got it here in front of me. So Sarah Ryan is the author of the chapbooks Never Leave the Foot of an Animal Unskinned from Pork Belly Press and Excellent Evidence of Human Activity, which is an awesome title, <laughs> um, from the Cupboard Pamphlet. In 2018, she was the winner of Gris's Pro Forma Contest and Cut Bank's Big Sky Small Prose Contest. Her work has been published in or is forthcoming from Pleiades, Diagram, Booth, Prairie Schooner, Thrush Poetry Journal, and others. And she's currently pursuing her PhD at Texas Tech. Great. So welcome, Sarah. All right. Um, can people hear me OK? I don't know how far away I can be from this until, OK. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be reading um, uh, a lot of uh, poems about kind of animals and the natural landscape and the wildness kind of within and also outside in the natural world. Um, and I was talking to Megan before, I was like, it's kind of hard because like literally all my poems are about this. So it was hard <laughs> picking a bunch uh, for you guys today. Um, so I have uh, 10 poems for you guys. Uh, so the first is called Call Me a Courage. I want to name all the birds to identify kingdom and phylum and order a taxonomy of beaked jaws, hard shells, feathers. I forget sometimes that we name everything that bleeds. I want to categorize their clumsy syllables, know them by their candy-colored wings, the soft nakedness of their feet. I want to call out to them, each one, by its name, as though I had known it all along. In the museum diorama, their bodies are mid-flight, perched, diving into glass. Oh, those four-chambered hearts, the hollowed bones of flightless deaths. Funny how we strive to name a prowl of jaguars, a streak of tigers, how we name companionship as though it is something surprising to want, to need. A brash of deer lingers in the dew-wet lawn of my childhood home, chewing clover, blinking into the dense fog. I wonder, what would we name a group of me? 20 versions of my body shift in a field. My skin collects wetness at dawn. I'm skittish, maybe. I look for shelter. A dissimulation of birds watches from the tree line. A host of sparrows bursts from an oak in a splash of darkness, black-throated. Everyone looks beautiful and white, like doves feathered romantic things. On my side of the glass, the creatures I see are always more frightening. Let's name us a murder, a courage, a loneliness. This next poem is called In Praise of the Exoskeleton. The ability to stay entirely untouched, unscavenged, unhaunted by the other bodies inside your own. Once, pavement split me right down the middle. I learned my blood and its spread, the lengths my skin went to in its healing, the way I lost and lost and came back, bright, pink, new. When men tell me what to think of my body, I pull my bones around me like a slick jacket of white, harder this way, rigid and resistant, ready for rocks. There are mechanics to this method, 
to becoming a shell and staying soft underneath. There's failure, too, in the scales I develop in direct sunlight, in the cracks that let the light in, the super glue that won't hold me. The doctor told me I will never grow taller, and I said, that's fine. People always see me as taller than I am. I am elastic energy. When you're not looking, I am a swarm of locusts. When you touch me, it sounds like thunder. This next poem is called Grasp. I learn the word for willow tree. I learn the word for howl and keep it in my throat. The word for tongue curls, the, world, the word for wolf curls underneath my tongue. I have studied pain this way, tucking it into the folds of my body where darkness settles. I wonder about the waking, the sun-split morning burns into orange peel, dappled heat. An extinct volcano comes back to life, but we aren't told how we know the mountain has begun to stir, how stone yawns and spins hot into the world again. I wish that I could say that I saved the morning dove, but I can't be sure. Every bird dies a death, falls from the sky and sleeps. It is hard to banish this thought, that everything wakes up and waits for living, for the word that names the blue color of a pale vein. Who wouldn't want to wake an ancient thing from, an, uh, from the deepest sleep? Who wouldn't want to dig and find the still wet blood of a long dead fawn? A miracle, maybe, how the earth shudders beneath us, how we dance along the fractures. And this poem is from um, the first chapbook that Clara mentioned, which was a poem or a book of poems and uh, short essays and endnotes, uh, specifically about uh, taxidermy um, and like why do we do taxidermy and like what does it mean and what does it say about humans? Um, so this is called "Of Men and Birds." Thrust your hook into his pelvis and suspend him in midair. This is so you can work with both hands. Be gentle with his neck. Give his legs a coat of arsenical soap. It protects him from insects. Disjoint his bones carefully. Fill him up with cotton, dry leaves, grass, or crumpled paper. Wood wool is driest and best. When you take him home, notice his body like a great downy pillow his bill as long as a fence rail. And what wings, and such feet. You have never seen such a bird, not even in your dreams. In your dreams, he is an old, rusty, second-hand crow. He is some good genius, a thimbleful of arsenic, a pair of eyes black as ink. When you stitch him up, make sure to treat him like a lucky bird, not a greasy swan. He should have a few stitches at his back, but not too many, for obvious reasons. You wouldn't want him to look a fool. This next poem uh, is called, I Thought There Would Be More Wolves. Here, at the dumb stroke of midnight, in the glass dome of roses, the woods at the end of the lake, I was taught where to wait patiently, to fold my hands on my lap like two sorry doves, to tie my shoes in knots too tight to unravel. It's incredible how the oceans meet and trade salinity, how carbonation stings our throats, but we keep drinking. I was never a wolf, but a girl with a red brick house, a girl with a bicycle made of puzzle pieces. I wasn't a deer, I wasn't a lamb, all my wars with the concrete were over. I'm driving alone to everywhere I am going. I can't strip my skin away, my fur, my wolf teeth, yellow and dull. This is called Rifle Season. They come north for the woods, for the soggy overhang of trees, the dampened noise and the echo, for the deer, the blood, the bullets, quick and vicious. The season brings the deer blinds, men clothed in forest. They rock their guns to sleep, cradle the metal bodies. 
here for the fur harvesting, the trapping, the hard and silver teeth, the stocked freezers swirling with ice, with ink dark meat, sinew, blood unravels onto concrete floors in damp garages. These men do not surprise me, their hands dirty, coarse, their tongues turn to gold in their mouths. They apologize, but their teeth are steel cages. They chomp and glint. They sparkle. It doesn't matter. I'm wounded. I limp into a clearing lit by the sun. Maybe I'll be safe here. I'm always surprised when they find me. The men, more and more of them, tumble from the fog. Their breath dirties the melting snow. The deer even, spooked. Hooves hurried and sharp. Maybe I'll wear fluorescent orange next time. Maybe I'll carry a whistle that calls the sky, the grouse, the crow, a dissimulation of birds. Uh, this poem uh, was actually inspired by a news story that happened, I want to say maybe like four years ago, five years ago, um, where I used to live in Michigan, the town over, uh, they were kind of renovating a certain area of, uh, of a field, a farm field, and uh, they were digging with a, what was it, a bulldozer or whatever, and uh, they found uh, the entire skeleton of a woolly mammoth. And, uh, and it was literally just down the street, basically, from where I used to live in Michigan. And, um, and it really struck me and was like, there are like woolly mammoths in Michigan. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is called uh, Woolly Bones. You get one day to dig, the farmer said. The harvest is here. This could have been the cornfield on the corner where the white dog barked at cars. This could have been my sister's cigarette hiding spot in the skull of the beast. There's a mammoth in Michigan. There's tusks in my backyard. There's vertebrae in my teeth. This could have been the mud in my basement. Once, a deer left its head in a hay field off the road. With a shovel, I hid it in the trees. I polished its ribs with bleach. This was a death I knew. Maybe the mammoth was hungry, or cold, or ancient, or sick, or so sure it was dying, and the raw field of green seemed like the right sleep, seemed like the right spot to fertilize the crop, but maybe killed by spear or arrow, kept in a pond as a prize. The bones showed signs of butchering, those soybeans must have burst from the ground the year they planted. I wonder if the farmer questioned that first grassy crop, doubted how the corn was sweetest the next year, knew how mud ran so deep it hit bones, how water pooled there in the heavy season, noticed how the rain knew where the thirst was, or how sometimes when he tilled the fields, the dirt flew through the air like fur. This poem is called, Look What I Have Done. I welcomed you like a hood of antlers, like bone broke down to velvet, like growth and the wind that raised me. In my mind, heaven is full of animals the earth didn't get to keep. Nice things taken away from a shrieking child with red cheeks, the dodo, the Tasmanian tiger, the heart beast, the passenger pigeon. Inside me, some goddess of war. Maybe she carries a bow and arrow. Maybe she is sculpted of marble. It is Friday, and I am swallowing the sun. The rats in my parents' backyard are so big, so strong, that they take the traps with them. They snap in the night, but the yard is empty. My womanhood hibernates in the winter, blows shrill whistles into damp mornings prunes the dead birds into small funerals of feathers. I must stay calm so as to preserve my wings. You could destroy them easily, just like that, with the bark of a tree, with a small gun. This is my second to last poem. This is called uh, Self-Portrait as Mammal. I have been lost for some time now. The hunt has been long and cold and maybe it has all been for nothing. 
Listen, my cat and I sleep back to back like two mirrored moons. This is how I learned my body's soft groan, its clumsy bones growing heavier each night. This is when fur tangles and emerges from my mouth like an animal. It is something familiar. I call it beast and it grows teeth. Somehow, the only thing I fear is the dull knock of my heart, its dangerous call into the wild. To quench its cry, I undress and redress and undress again in front of the window like the whole world can see me. I glow like lamplight, like some tropical and unnamed creature, feathered and clawed, foul or forked tongue. What would it take to be an assassin of my body's claim to blood and pain? I wish I could be as flashy as the waterfall as Niagara's roar. It spills and does not stop, even when engineers divert the water and it becomes a drizzle, even when a bird flies into the rush, even when I shiver in the mist, lean into the spray. All right, and this is my last poem. It's called Beast Fables. We are all animals here, the wily foxes on two legs eating at the dinner table, the crying wolf's tail caught in the mower. The tiger in your sister's volleyball jersey becomes a flurry of blood. And here is proximity, the animal in all our skins, behind the glass, in the gutters. This is a lesson in fake dead and real dead, in learning all the lies six cats mourning the death of their brother. You have a tea party in fur and feathers. This is the storybook, seeing your body turn to dust in the glimmer of mirrors. In his honest twitching face, you see what the rabbit really wants. Maybe you become the rabbit, and then here we are again, brute and human, shaved, but still waking up with hair in our teeth. So next is Megan Giles. Giles, Giles, I'm so sorry. I literally, literally always do that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> All right, so Megan E. Giles is pursuing a PhD at Texas Tech University, where she serves as managing editor for Iron Horse Literary Review. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Cimarron Review, South Dakota Review, Hayden's Ferry Review Online, Measure, a review of formal poetry, and elsewhere. Thanks everyone for coming here today. Um, I'm just gonna read, I think I have, can everyone hear me? I can't, there. I'm gonna read, I think, uh, 10 or 11 poems, so. Um. Okay, this first one is called Nowhere Now. When my partner asks me what is the reason while he comforts me, my talk turns to the bed of rattlesnakes and sweet water for this year's roundup their bodies twisting in pillowcase linen. Some Texas sun caught on an arm that slips gently each into a pillowcase like roofies with the same intention as venom. A difficulty with vision, a dream where you wake gasping, muscles made to weaken. Their scales match the color of that drink a Jack and Coke clouded. Their rattle is ice in an opaque cup. The Colosseum that holds them is its particular own kind of loneliness, bodies folding over themselves, piled sheets, having come to just in the crook of a pillowcase, bodies collapsing on concrete. Like me, they don't know yet what's happened except through instinct slopped off and milked clean, where understanding our rattles and venom are useless, our mouths are fixed open. Those parts of us are being taken home with some unknowable someone. It didn't matter what we had on, the audience cheers witness, buys ammunition and more guns, triggering our skin comes off like clothing. 
You can find us in a heap in the trash, beginning again to learn the language of movement. We're looking for a trace of what was taken, our rattles and mouths. We're coming up absent of teeth and tails, a memory stashed somewhere here in the body and nowhere now. This one's called a reception. Liquored, you drive us while the other couples are honeymooned in their hotels. That rose bouquet I caught dying already and we passed the spot where you pulled over and hit me hit me next to wildflowers and tar. How my tin can bruise has bloomed like blue bonnets, outgrown of soil skin, a handful of blue bonnets, a yellow yarrow, two prairie larkspurs pressed between tissue, a tattoo raised on my thigh, there peeking out beneath the cotton foliage of my dress, a gift. Uh, this next one's called Homecoming Mums. <clears throat> Forever flowers, manufactured white and plastic, made for us by our boyfriends as moms, like theirs were made by their own boyfriends as moms before homecoming. Forever hot, glued to Hobby Lobby cardboard and the same blue ribbons given to their prize-winning pecan pies and the ones that clung to our pony tails when we played volleyball. We wore gold glitter in our hair and on our eyelids. We matched each gold glint of our ribbons glitter lettering that showcased our love of friendship, the name of our misspelled school, and that idea of coming home. We navigated adolescence's fluorescent hallways, got caught up in their gravity, and wore the silver football and cheerleading charms that dangled on our moms the same as crosses on all of our James Avery bracelets. Texas staple, as sure as blue bonnets and hoop skirts in the football parking lot as we herded toward the field's cattle gates. In the packed metal bleachers, we stood together, shoulder touching shoulder. We hollered loud underneath the floodlights that drown out each individual star, like the lights that turned on in our driveways when we snuck home. Heavy enough to stretch out our shirts, those mums shining and pinned on us. And this next short poem is called Lightning Bugs. <clears throat> Unplugged from their bodies, their lights rolled like glass beads on my fingertips, unblinking little lanterns that stuck to each other and my skin. So I strung them to a necklace, each light a tiny prayer for the glow that wasn't in me. Um, this poem's called Prairie Dogs. It's for my friend Colin. How can I say this? I saw a body on the road. I was in the mountains where the air is a kind of skin you're supposed to wear when you are old. It looked almost human. I turned the headlights down. The exhaust from the car inhaled all color along the highway, left us tar and gray and billows. All morning, the morning before your funeral, fog hung down like the fleece I would have worn if I hadn't still been sleeping. It shouldn't have been there. In Lubbock, where the air holds up dry like the hands of farmers who pray for rain. You were ashes that afternoon when we saw you. Before that, a body. Your sister's skin was gray around her eyes. But there in the headlight fog, I saw its sister hold her mouth on her brother's skin. She held onto him the way a sister can hold, all that weight in her teeth. The headlights reflected back at us, and for a moment I learned how to make the shadows of bodies move. Her shadow pulled him off the road. My mouth was full of fur while I drove. From our front porch. 
Here the leaves have fallen, the trees have clearly moved on. Another season we gather and sleep, these dormant bodies meant to remind us in our yard. But I remember the porch, the way the private came. He told us he dreamed every night her brother Philip. Every night, Balad and First Lieutenant Philip pulling this private's body off of other bodies until her brother became the body in the private's place. Here he tells us only whiskey makes him sleep and his dreams gather like leaves, like bodies of decomposing bodies he falls into. We try to collect them, those dreams in our yard leaves that stopped change. We don't have the heart to bag them, to put them inside any kind of bag. Instead, we pack them into some neat pile in our yard's far corner, and just as soon as we've forgotten, here one red one has fallen at our feet. Um, this is a poem I wrote after the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, one in a committee of vultures after Dr. Ford's testimony. After they finish circling an open wound on the asphalt, they dive straight into it. They break open a body on the brink of road rot as if it were made for them scavenging. Perhaps that's why their wings each look uniform, each feather frayed at the sight of a body's unraveling. They need another body to stay relevant, decomposition fuel. I couldn't tell you then which one I was in this moment, the body splayed absent, a body's abandonment, or the one who swallows death when she's handed it. Okay, I have three more. <clears throat> Nocturnal scavengers. Despite this night's heat, no windows untuck from bedrooms. The town has shut its eyelids for the night, and the TV lights glow tired, blink through curtains, static dreams. These days roll over in beds, save for whoever's absent from them. I'm in the street. The possums turn over, containers in our yard find nothing. This abandoned lot was taken over by the vine, hand-sized moonflower moons bloom open, their pillow dipped, mouths breathe in this heat, our desert empty in moonlight. I mimic this nightly unfolding, but my ribs won't open. Somewhere underneath this full moon showing, I'll find a trellis and climb out of my body. When we still worked at the nursery. <clears throat> in the bathroom, I watched her bowed body plant its pulp in the toilet while the man who wasn't her husband was with her husband. They were planting desert willows too late in the season for their age, too far in the afternoon. They left us women to water. Nothing could survive that heat that shocks the roots and soil. It couldn't take that much stress. The men didn't know that root ball of burlap wouldn't hold, still dug deep through caliche. We watched it unravel and float there before I flushed it. Before it swirled somehow inside us a sickness that part of her bloomed burgundy, a peony in porcelain snow. And my last poem, Prada Marfa. The sky on the wing of Texas submerges everything in blue, as though we're looking into the world's driest and most lonely aquarium, where cacti, coral, and sand have sunk to the bottom, along with bones and the slow sway of dust, devils and the feather grass. This treasure box sits pretty, sunken to the side of the road. Like us, dead girls, blue-tinted as everything, 
handbags slouch inside like unused organs, all leather along the shelf of a rib cage. If eyes are windows, we look through them and see vacancy, and the light from the security camera blinks back. Stink bugs and sugar ants march into these dilapidated tear ducts made wide by decay. Unlike our rural bodies, they call this a sculpture without any doors for people to shop there, and someone will rebuild it again and alter it like a memory. Someone will cover the tattooed tags on its side, replace the skirt of the awning or patch its shotgun holes, rifle through and uproot the weeds overgrown like our hair. Someone will brush up the bugs and seal its openings, replace whatever was stolen, remove the upside down boots on the barbed wire fence posts behind it, the ones left to fashion, to us a path, all along the other side of the sky. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is Clara. I don't know if they got last name. Vidala. Okay, sorry. I should have checked that before. Um, Clara Bush Vidala is a veterinarian and poet in Salina, Texas. She is the author of two poetry books. Prairie Smoke Poems from the Grasslands, and Beast Invites Me In, which is available for pre-order now. Um, her work has been featured at the Houston Poetry Festival, the Pegasus Reading Series in Dallas, Texas, and at Pryor's Sowell Conferences. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Thimble Literary Magazine, um, Swim, and OK Donkey Lit Mag. I like it. I don't know. I was like, that's a good name. <laughs> okay. So what better way to start reading poems about wild than with a domestic dog poem? Uh, this is for my dog, Lulu, who's just like my heart pet. Um, and it's called Lulu Turns to Leaves in the Sun. Can everybody hear me okay? okay. Um, Lulu Turns to Leaves in the Sun. There is an old energy that curves tired things the shape of sleep. The old dogs know it best. Near the end, their whole old bodies bend in dirty circles, knobbled bones croaking. Despite ache, age, they yip, spin, fling dust, make ceremony of themselves. My old dog sighs. She lays each of her joints precisely beside me. She melts deep brown red into the leaves around her. She looks up into the sky. When she curls her ear toward the dirt again, I imagine what she must hear is all the hard songs of the earth's long dead creatures. She rolls erratically, belly up, bites her old foot next when she settles. She has ground her incisors to bits doing this. The foot is loud in her mouth, the bones in the foot jangling, Arthritis, probably. Probably her strong jaw keeps her from forgetting. Animal, animal, under a spell. She is night blind, eyes soft milk, but not cataract. She walks slowly over. With each of her tender steps, I hardly move at all, as if my stiffness could compel her stride closer, closer. She turns her head to me sits sharply with her hips, not knees, grins at me, all of her short teeth. And a uh, funny story for you, Sarah, actually. Um, I found Sarah's work almost immediately after I had taken a taxidermy class, oh, which really? was like <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> so I think you'll like this next one, which is called Taxidermy Class. Um, taxidermy Class. The mice we use are ethical. They come from frozen reptile food. We warm them up by rubbing abdomens between our palms until the limbs resign to let us sculpt their disembodied joints with wire. Now, we offer crucifixion in reverse. We splay their palms and pierce them. We allow their empty skins to flail like flags. We curse the moisture weeping out of every mouse. We spread detergent like a salve. It dries us out. 
Our teacher tells us all about the do's and don'ts while sewing up their spines, how freezing twice destroys a rodent's pelt. The hair that keeps them looking live falls out. Red tail eating possum in the road. There is often no blood in the road, or we move too fast to see it. In this scene, possum's marsupial abdomen is splayed to reveal its innards. See no blood, see no babies on her back, see no reason to believe she is, any part of her, any longer, alive. Atop possum is a hawk with a red tail. It bows its head, see no blood in its beak, see no fresh flesh clutched in its feet. It may as well have been a prayer. Her beak descends, she is alone. She rises up, screeching like an eagle. If you are driving fast enough, see no possum, but it is there. Only a frantic bird tearing something, but it is there, furred and teethed. See the hawk, framed wild, rocking, tail to sky. Then see shuddering beak, swallowing clouds and stars, and eventually the moon. No light, see no blood, see no possum left, as if instead of eaten, collapsed into particulate, bone, hair, cast into the raptor to be taken, taken, strewn privately from the hawk's sharp mouth, a meal for its precious, perfect child. I have a couple of snake poems, so this is the first one, mostly because uh, we live on about 10 acres in the country now, and we, see snakes like every single day. So, um, and I think they're cool, but anyway. Bull snake and the ceramic egg. Bull snake holes up in the bushes near the chicken coop. He conducts a ceremony of coiling scales. He rubs his imprint into the mud under a wood pile before his dance of unwinding begins. He collects his ribs, the hundreds tingling down his spine, walks on them like centipedes feet. Someone sees him while tending chickens, while placing ceramic eggs to stop their brooding, while trying to fool the old hens into thinking they're prolific. The hens have lost too many eggs, and this time they want to keep this part of themselves. Somehow ceramic is enough for them, cold and oval-shaped, the same as the numb feeling they get pushing a live egg from their bodies. They believe this is a fine one, that they are gravid, hard with creation, stoic and strong, enough to stop the clucking and stomping of feet? Or was it that someone saw a bull snake that made them quit their nervous habitations? Was it that they felt believed and no longer violated by his long, tawdry body slinking? Was it that they knew the ceramic egg would be enough for him to eat and never return? Was it that they had ceremony of their own to warble about? Was all this spectacle just the careful casting of their spell? Bull snake holes up in the bushes near the chicken coop. He can no longer eat, ribs spread wide. It won't come up, the cursed egg. And even though we all wanted to see him live, we find a twisted skeleton curled in the aftermath, ceramic egg curled under the bones of his back, where the flesh of his smooth belly, now withered, used to keep it warm. Comparative anatomy or learning to fly. Dig in, peel back ribs, that thick chest, osteophyte your spine, flatten, squeeze. When your heart veers, keep your arms wing tight. The angle of flight will hum like strumming sinew when you find it. Breathe in the heave you feel your lungs becoming. Listen. First, point your ulna. Keep your wrist fast and slight. Somewhere deep, something plucks adrenaline you can hear. The muscles of your breast are weary, hard, and painful. Instead of the soft oval of your mouth, a slender muzzle erupts, or a harsh beak. Bring your arms toward your middle before the little weasel in your ear whispers its toothy doubt. Bring your arms in, quick. 
try to imagine the actual pushing of your organs, the rush of liquid all the way out to your fingertips. Imagine your pale skin translucent like a frog's bellowing throat. Somewhere, that flat sound lift your fingers like toad's tongues up, up. Your body is the sum of all the creatures that inhabit it. Your skin might fail, but the animal in you will float like a mockingbird, like the pup of a free-tailed bat. And this poem is actually about um, when I was a kid, we were fishing in Florida, I think it was, and I caught a hammerhead shark, which was like the coolest thing ever for a six-year-old kid. Um, so this is called Hammerhead. My kid's skin, made of silk, strokes the barbed leather shark's back, its salt scale sandpapering my hand. As the sun goes down, the older boy on the beach dumbly jumps to shove the thick clot of his fist into its teeth, and I wish I'd hissed, he's still alive. My white hair shaking in the wind, pale as the inside of his gills. I touch his belly as if my fingers could cut him like a paring knife, but we do not gut this fish. Instead, I turn into fish, wade my waist into the surf. The shark hovers over my hands for this moment in which I am more than mammal, then hammers his flat head deep, deep into the sea. Another day, we collect shark's teeth and sand dollars at Boca Chica, a new beach, a different kind of shore. Sure that I was a fish, I made my name in the sand and let it be swept away. The tide holds my name in its mouth even now. A thin line of foam develops at the edge of my lip when I think about it. The foam is salty. I sweat and sweat to remember the sharp, convincing pull of the shark, the cold hook slung hard behind his teeth. And this is another sort of snake poem. Um, it's called Parthenogenesis, and it's written after a story I saw about, and some people may have seen, about an anaconda earlier this year in the New England Zoo that um, gave birth to baby anacondas via parthenogenesis, uh, which basically means reproduction <coughs> without a male present. So this is a female anaconda that never had been exposed to any male snakes, and um, she had two babies that survived, which is crazy. Um, so parthenogenesis. Oh, also bear with me because this is a, a crown of sonnets and I, I don't know why I did that, but it's there, so uh, anyway. In the beginning, there were 20 teeth. We named them after what they did, the milk they gnawed on like kernels of cottage cheese, milk teeth after curdled milk, Faces filled with little houses made of bone, their gum front lawns all pink and glistening, the warm saliva sprinkling from the tongue, the tongue unraveling over them. Its whispers turned between the tic-tacs, unintelligent and babbling. Once I found an envelope, a heavy ounce was taped inside the bent certificate and written near the fold, a note in cursive. She did not need help. She is so tough, she pulled it out herself. She is so tough, she pulled it out herself, the thorn an itch, her hide a map of thorns she bears without a flinch. She knows herself and knows that this will pass, and the unborn, her litter clothed in thorns, will find it hard to come undone because their mother did not for anyone either. When she heard indecence, she undid her mouth and spit a forked utensil from her throat, her tongue. The snake maneuver saves her, saves the sex for pleasure, not procreation. She's hung up. Is her bearing children a hex on future generations, plague on them? She clones herself like a bacterium. She clones herself like a bacterium instead of letting testes spill inside her organs. She creates the organs sperm is spread from. She manipulates inside herself her reproductive tissues. Now, with nothing but her choice, she writhes a bit, hermaphroditic as amoeba. Now, she tenses muscle, revels in her wit. Oh, thinks the anaconda in a zoo. 
This is what it means to be a captive. Keep her, keep her, keep her DNA too. This is what it means to be adaptive. A constellation slithers in me, aches. You'll never understand the things we make. You'll never understand. The things we make are sacred, full of blood and organs, guts that turn with peristalsis, hearts like cake, red velvet, sugar veins. They're filled all up with knowing. Do you think the consciousness of every offspring is the same as hers, the mother's? What does this say about us? A woman slithers, do we all with her? We do not. The collective of serpent is nest, pit, knot, or bed we've made and lay in, scales all tangled up in argument. We don't hive mind, don't perform this snake's play. But we will slither into, dark and hard, the pit of other snakes. This is the part, the pit of other snakes. This is the part we live for. We forget the teeth we feel starting their slendering into fangs, part the cleft below our nose to swallow, reel back, retrograde our necks to make a sound like hissing, gasp. We listen like our heads have holes for heat, for intensity, bound by snake pit sincerity. We are dead before we realize we're dying. The throng of snakes and snakelets suffocating, dead before our tails have chance to rattle long, incessant rattles. Snakes have lost their heads attempting calm, losing to the attempt. I have seen it happen, been the serpent. I have seen it happen, been the serpent whose frantic dances, struggles in a pool of water in the zoo enclosure meant for display. In the pools, a waterfall that twists and flips the little snake. It makes her look unhinged. Her accidental fall might be the death of her. I watch the snake and see myself, her desperate coil, a call for help, the curl of vertebra, a sign, a dive beneath the waves is imminent. I watch the snake while she drowns. All her turns were painful, hard to watch. And I ask then, why is she swimming to the wall like that? My hand presses against the plexiglass. My hand presses against the plexiglass. The beginning of it is hard to name. Let's call it phobia, call it too fast. Let's say an instinct that I have to tame. If I were anaconda, I might feel like I'm invincible, like I am made from coral, which still buds itself during real and certain danger. Warm water, the spade by which it splits to two coral, three, but I'm distracted. Snake is twirling now, the one beneath the waterfall. It comes to mind that of snakes born from mother snake as clones, no matter which direction they emerge, almost all of them still die, parts of her. Uh, one more poem, um, and this is about an experience I had in Allen, Texas, um, where I got to follow my friend who's a large animal veterinarian, um, and she was there watching over the livestock and stuff at the, at the rodeo. Um, and it was a bull riding um, thing that we were watching. So this is called, Dear God, Please Protect Our Livestock. Prayer at the PBR, Allen, Texas, 2018. Dear God, please protect our livestock. Dear God, let the pull of the rope around the bull's privates never fray or make splinters of its weave. Dear God, please keep the safety officer on his horse and let his flailing congregation keep the perfect quaff of cowboy hats upon their unhelmeted heads. Dear God, let every bull win, and by win we mean buck the some bitches trying to ride them, kick their hind feet up, their double-muscled haunches glistening. This bull's name, for God's sake, is Night Sweats. Let them twist their beefy spines an impossible helix, their DNA, let it be worth the hundreds of thousands of broken bones and torqued joints. Let that one laying down with its rider kicking it with spurs rise up only to kill him or not rise up at all. Oh, and this one's name is Make America Great Again, and they have to say this twice, dear God. Dear God, who is the Goliath? Is it Shattered Dreams, or Handsome Jeff, or Lil Fool? 
Or was it the ten-year-old rider I saw kick up dust with a victory dance? After that, I saw a riderless bull dig and spin his feet in every direction in the dirt, but he wouldn't run toward the chutes. No, not toward them. Dear God, protect our livestock from their terrible tempers. This one breaks the pretty banner off the stall door. That one jerks its pole toward the clowns and then the horse and then snorts and spits. Its rider has long jumped over the railings by the time the rouge has lifted from his eyes. His eyes are clenched fists. This one's name is Filthy Animal. Dear God, let a heifer bear another and let it be pleasurable for her. Dear God, let them all be sons of bushwhacker whose semen bucks and squirms among them. Let there be bulls squat and hefty for the sons of cowboys. Let those of them have horns and let us pull leather chaps over the sun's thighs so they can ride as young as they're able. Let the bulls realize that the chaps rubbing against them are made of their brother's skin. Each time they flip their nose toward the rider's feet, let the snot alone scare the human off their backs. Let us leave them alone. And if you won't, dear God, please protect our livestock. Dear God, let them live to buck the business out of us. Let them be anger, rippling sweat of it, body twirling toward the arena top, curling knees and slinging feet, hooves and instead of front teeth, horns gnashing. Show sure enough, with every swing of the concrete skull in the too tiny chute, dear God, let us pray. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.